Hi everyone, uh, and welcome back to another conversation uh, about CVI. Uh, as you know, my name is Professor John Ravenscroft, and it really gives me great pleasure because today I'm going to be uh, uh, talking and chatting with, with Matt Tijin. Hi, Matt, how are you doing? I'm good. Hi, John, how are you? Thank you yeah, for I'm having me. Very well. I appreciate yeah. it. So uh, currently, uh, I'm just outside of Edinburgh, and it's around uh, four o'clock, uh, seven minutes past four. Where, where are you, and what time is it, Matt? Okay, uh, I am in uh, Durham, Connecticut, which is near the middle of the state, and it is uh, 11 o'clock in the morning here. All right, excellent. So um, I first met Matt, I think, uh, oh, I can't remember how many years ago, it was at a pediatric conference in Omaha, where Matt presented uh, the topic we're going to talk about today. Right. I, I don't know if you remember, Matt, but that um, at the conference, well, at the, at the hotel conference, it was divided into two. And at one side, it was this pediatric conference where we were talking about CVI and, and, and other issues related to childhood vision impairment. But at the yeah. other, there was the Omaha State Drag Queen competition. Do you remember that? <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I didn't, you know, that, that explains some of the people. I got to know a few people in the hotel who were drag queens and it didn't occur to me. I didn't, I didn't see a lot of drag queens, so I didn't realize that that was a whole convention, but that explains why they were there. Yeah, yeah, so it's just bizarre. So I was in a lift with one that was like seven foot tall in the heels and the hair made him around nine, 10 feet tall. And it was just this, I'm a short guy. I'm only five foot six kind of thing. And it was just yeah. this bizarre. I'm off to this conference and we had a nice chat and he was off to compete. I don't know how he did. But anyway, I digress. I digress. So it was a memorable conference, A, because of that, and B, I saw you present and I thought, I definitely got to, I got to interview you. So, uh, so, so great. So oh, thanks thanks. For coming on. So, yeah, so much. thanks for having me. So I'm going to hang over, hand over to you now. And I'm just going to ask, as I ask everyone, um, who are you, Matt? And what do you do? <laughs> um, well, I'm a, a teacher. I'm a teacher of students with visual impairments in Connecticut. And um, I, uh, I work for the state um, as an education consultant. That's what our, our title is. And it's really a mixture of consulting and direct service uh, with students. So it's a really nice mixture of getting to work with the students and getting to really know them, but then also um, uh, getting to sort of uh, consult and, and collaborate with the teams as well. Um, and I feel really fortunate that we have a special services division uh, or unit um, at our state agency, and I'm part of that, which means that I, um, I get to work um, solely with students who have visual and multiple impairments. Um, and it's just a, it's a, I'm formerly a special education teacher, so it sort of combines my two passions of um, working with kids with visual impairments and those who have additional uh, impairments as well. And I just get to work with such wonderful kids and families, so I'm just really happy to be a part of that. Great, great. And, and um, I like the title, Education Consultant. I think, uh, you know, I might adapt some of that, I think. Um, so what, so these chats are about um, CVI. So what got you interested in CVI? What, what was that, what was that kind of um, moment when you thought, oh, look, I really, I got to know a bit more about this. I'm seeing a lot of kids with these kind of uh, 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 functional behaviors. So, uh, you know, what, what got you interested? Yeah, well, it, so it started, um, when I was at UMass Boston learning to be a TVI, um, I had to, for one of my assignments, I had to do an interview um, with a TVI who was a veteran in the field. <clears throat> and so I ended up interviewing um, one of my favorite uh, colleagues, uh, Peg Palmer. Uh, and she, I didn't, all I knew about her at the time was that she was my friend's mother in high school. And uh, I, 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 I kind of known in the back of my head that she was, that she worked with kids with visual impairments, but I didn't know anything beyond that. So when I had to do this assignment, I reached out to her and she graciously invited me over one summer day to sit on her porch and drink some lemonade and talk about being a TVI. And I remember she talked mostly about her passion and working with kids with something called cortical visual impairment. And I, and she talked about how, you know, working with these young children with CVI and being there sort of like when she showed the parents how the child can see and what types of things the child was able to see and what types of interventions we could do to make things more accessible in the home environment. And she talked with such passion about it that I thought, wow, I, you know, I'm thinking to myself, I really want to do this. I want to do what she's doing. I want to work with kids with cortical visual impairment. Um, the only thing was, is I had no idea what she meant. I didn't know what CVI <laughs> was. 
so I'm thinking like of cortical. She keeps saying cortical. And I'm thinking, you know, I was just in the first class at UMass Boston. We hadn't gotten that far yet. So we're talking about the eye. And I'm thinking to myself, well, maybe a cortical is part of the retina or something like that. Maybe, you know. It's, <laughs> so anyway, I, I did some research into it when I got home and uh, just really thought, wow, this is fascinating. It has to do with the brain. And, you know, I learned a lot more about it. And then uh, later that year, um, I was taking a class with uh, Derek Wright and with uh, Tammy Reisman at UMass Boston. And um, for one class, I was reading uh, Christine Roman's book. And for the other class, um, uh, Derek Wright gave me an article uh, by Gordon Dutton on ventral and dorsal stream functions. And I thought like, wow, this is, I just want to keep learning more and more and more about this. And then I started getting out in the field and meeting kids with CVI. And then I really uh, fell in love with it. So, Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, I think that's how we all start in a way. So we we hear it, we look it up and we go, yeah, 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 yeah. What the hell is that all about? And then you right. start doing the work and you start reading about it and you go, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I sort of got it now, but you know, it's a, it's such a big field and it's such a new field and uh, you know, we're sort of learning every day, which, which is great. You know, you know, yeah. like, uh, that, that's what I like about it as well is not only, not only obviously supporting children and families, but it's just that we're just learning so much about the brain and vision and how to support children and families. You know, that's the bit. Yeah. Cool. So, so yeah. speaking about support there, Matt, the reason why I, I wanted to have a chat with you is like, I, um, I, I think it's in Christine's new book uh, and I saw you present on this as well about the complexity framework. And yeah. I, really, I really want you to um, help me and go through with that. Cause I think it's a great thing, right? I, I teach it to my students and uh on, on my tvi program up here in edinburgh and uh hey i want to know if i'm teaching it right <laughs> <laughs> so, hey, so thank you i'd be happy to <laughs> so give me a lesson matt <laughs> all right here we go let's see i'd be happy to do that i'm gonna i'm gonna um share my screen first well okay. maybe i better pull up the powerpoint first okay let's see here and while you're doing that, I'm going to switch um, uh, views uh, if I can. So I'm going to switch mm -hmm. to speaker view. All right. And click screen. Okay. All right. Oh, all right. Okay, good. And slideshow. Okay. Okay. I can see. All right. You can see it. Is the slide taking up most of the screen? I, it, it is, but I've also got speaker view. I've got the speaker's view of the slideshows. So the next slide. Oh, okay. Let's see. Up. Yeah. Um, okay. Let's see. Yeah. So it's, it's almost like don't do presenter view or something. Yeah. That's there we good. go. Okay. That's <laughs> good. Great. So, um, yeah. So I figured I'd just start off by telling people and, um, you know, why, sort of like what led me to come up with this framework and why I thought it was needed. Um, so I'll start off with just an anecdote, which is really how it started for me was um, I was working with a student who I'll call Aiden um, for this for this presentation for this talk. And uh, so um, Aiden um, was in first grade at the time and uh, he, um, he had CVI and on Christine Roman's CVI range, he was coming out to about a late phase two. And what that meant for him was that he was using his vision for most tasks throughout the day. <clears throat> But when it came to the complexity of the general education environment and of the, the increasingly academic work that they were asking kids to do as the grade levels increased, <clears throat> excuse me, then he was having trouble with that. You know, it was complex for him. He was fatiguing a lot. Um, when he was asked to do too much visually all at once, you'd start to see behaviors that the team wouldn't necessarily realize were maybe partly because of the visual demands that they were putting on him. And so my idea for what's the complexity framework started with this one day when I went to visit Aiden and uh, he was typically doing, he was typically in his first grade classroom for more of the social activities, snack time and uh, cooperative play, morning meeting and things like that. But for his academic goals on his IEP, his, his individual education plan, he was um, mostly going into a quiet resource room to work with his special education instructor on those goals. And one of those goals was math. And we were excited because Aiden had just recently sort of gone from the world of 3D and manipulatives, um, doing math that way, um, which he was very successful at in kindergarten. All of a sudden, he was now starting to do math in the 2D world, sort of being able to read a math problem and complete it. 
And uh, it was really exciting, but he was doing that work in the quiet resource room with his special education teacher. Now, this day that I went to visit him, he was actually um, in the general education classroom and they were asking him to do um, his printed math worksheet in that environment. And when I got there, he was kind of slouched down in his seat. He was giggling and being really silly. Every time they put the paper on his desk and pencil, he would just sort of swipe them off. And um, the, the, the instructors were getting frustrated. And I suggested to them, I said, you know, I think it might have something to do with the fact that he's in a very complex environment right now. There's lots of noise. Kids are walking around to talk to each other and hand in their papers. Someone's using the pencil sharpener. There's all this visual clutter, uh, visual movement and uh, noise coming from the environment. And we're asking him to do this here. And they said, well, I think he can do it. He's, he's been doing it in um, his, his special ed teacher's room. So we think this is just behavioral. Uh, and that was the phrase that I was hearing a lot with a lot of my students is just behavioral. And so I left that day thinking I've got a lot of work to do as the consultant. I mean, this was a really motivated, uh, great team. I had given them a lot of training on CBI and on complexity and how it affects a child. And there were pockets or areas of Aiden's day that were really well adapted. And so they got it to some level, but they just didn't seem to be generalizing it to all areas of his day, like that need to provide accommodations. And so as I was driving away that day, I kind of really saw these patterns that weren't just with Aiden's team, but they were with a lot of my teams. So, uh, you know, I was finding that a lot of my teams had um, in, in, an inadequate understanding of visual complexity and how to generalize those interventions throughout the day. Um, I was seeing tasks that were above my students' visual abilities um, in environments sometimes that were too complex for the given task. And then also, um, this was true in Aiden's case, was that there were pockets of his day where there was a lot of cumulative complexity, like, for instance, having lunch and then recess and then math and then reading all in a row and just seeing this visual fatigue set in um, by, the, by the afternoon. Yeah, can, can, can um, I just, just, just inter, interject there? Yeah, Sorry, yeah. Uh, um, I mean, I think that's really important to consider here. If you just want to go back to that previous slide, if you can, um, mm -hmm. just that, just the fact that you mentioned lunch and recess there as well. I mean, many people forget about the complexity of that visual scene during, during break right. time, you know? I mean, it's just, there's a lot right. going on there as well, you know? It's not oh, yeah. within the classroom, it's, you know, it's, it's out at lunch, it's, it's that recess time, you know? So, so, so great, great that it's in, Matt. Brilliant. Yeah, and, they, and yeah, because I think that's a good point that you make. I mean, a lot of times I think teams think of it as a break from the work, but when, when you have CVI, like if you have optic ataxia, if you have difficulty guiding your lower limbs, using your vision and, and you know, playing on the playscape with a bunch of kids running around can be the hardest work of your day uh, for some kids. Um, you know, so yeah, definitely. Yeah, um, and then, uh, you know, so I kind of, I, I call these the big three, you know, the, the sort of the big three factors in the environment that I feel like really are sort of barriers to my students' visual access. Um, and one is the, the sort of that visual movement in the student's peripheral field being distracting or maybe overwhelming. Um, also an overload of visual information, like if the, you know, typical general ed classroom is very complex, posters everywhere, everything, you know, lots of books, just lots of visual information. And then the noise um, of the environment. And I like this quote from Nicola McDowell's blog from CVI Scotland. She talks about being in the general ed classroom in high school and she says, this constant movement, overload of visual information, and noise all conspired to cause my brain to shut down even further. It was simply too much to process. Yeah. So, you know, and I like how she says my brain too, because I think sometimes visual fatigue is thought of as, oh, your eyes are tired. But this could be thought of maybe as brain fatigue too. You know, I mean, it's, um, and then there's a chapter, I won't maybe read all these quotes, but there's um, a chapter in Vision in the Brain by uh, Dutton and Lueck. Um, that's all about behavior and CDI and sort of how the two are intertwined. It's chapter seven. And um, there's just so much useful information in there that, that has really helped me understand how, um, uh, how, how CBI can affect a person's behavior. And, um, you know, Therese Poletko is one of the authors of the chapter and she talks about, she talks about the child's behavior being described as inappropriate, having anxiety, outbursts, withdrawal. Um, and I like to put inappropriate behavior in quotations because I feel like if we as the educators haven't designed appropriate activities for the child, it's probably not fair to call their response to those activities inappropriate. Yeah, um, great, great yeah. comment there. Great, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And uh, there's also on CVI Scotland a nice um, article about CVI meltdowns, uh, they call it, just about um, how parents have observed uh, their own children's behavioral responses to a, a visually overwhelming um, environment. 
Yeah, uh, I, I, I like to describe that. I, I can't remember if I talked about it in, in another interview or not. It's just that, you know, you can see and understand why when kids go into like a supermarket, you know, supermarkets are just this um, concophony of, of visual noise, of, of auditory noise, of just everything, mm. you know, and, and whether a, a child has CVI or not, we often see behaviors that are different, you know, for any yeah. child, you know, I mean, even when I go into supermarkets or when we used to be able to go into supermarkets, I haven't been one for right. months now, <laughs> um, you know, it's, that, that, it's just, it's just, you know, so it is, you know, is it right to call it inappropriate behavior when, when you so brilliantly describe it as when we've set that curriculum, you know, to, 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 to almost generate that behavior, you know, yeah. it's great, great. And, and that's great. You're not putting it on the kids, Matt. That's fantastic. Yeah. It's, it's almost like that. It's almost like that response, that, that inappropriate behavior, quote unquote, we could even think of it as a reasonable response to an inappropriate activity, you know, like how any of us would maybe behave in certain ways if we were pushed to our max, you know, um, by sort of checking out of the activity and not wanting to do it. Um, and I've had, I want to, this next slide is to, just to illustrate the types of work environments that we're all used to. Uh, you know, I, I've, I've been working with some great teachers before who have been excellent collaborators who have, but then also said to me, um, well, we don't want to go overboard and, and kind of redesign their whole classroom because, or their whole work environment, because no one's going to do that in the real world. Um, and uh, I, it was, a, it was a, a reasonable point, I think, for a teacher to make. And I, there are a lot of sort of counterpoints, counter arguments that I have to that. But I just want to share one right now uh, uh, that sort of goes along with my argument about why we should be um, sort of redesigning the work areas for students. And uh, the, the first is just that we, we design our own workspaces to fit with what's what's well within our threshold for complexity. So one day I was working in a library in between students and I was typing reports and I just kind of sat back and I looked at my environment and took it in. I was in a library, I had this cubicle I was sitting in here, it was totally quiet in the room. And I thought, I'm writing a report right now about my student who has CVI and I'm trying to explain to the team why we need to adapt their environment to be less complex. And I thought I should just show them a picture of the type of environments that we design for ourselves to work in and then juxtapose that with a view from my student's desk in her <laughs> classroom. You know, so I mean, if, if I'm saying, well, this is how in the real world I've designed my work environment. Otherwise, if it was like this, I couldn't write my report, you know, but we're asking this student to work in this environment. So... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, and, and I've just realized, Matt, and you know, uh, this is, th this will be on video forever kind of thing. Hey, look at the complexity of behind me, you know, maybe I should have oh, right. moved, <laughs> moved my study right. into something else, you know, yeah, so uh, yeah. maybe I'll be more productive if I just get rid of all that crap that's behind me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, anyway. it's, funny that you mentioned, it's funny that you mentioned the complexity behind you too, because I've been doing Zoom meetings with a lot of my students. And now that I think about it, I haven't been controlling the background behind me. So I'm asking them to look at me and I've got bookshelf in my other room. I've got bookshelves in the background with all sorts of information on it. I should probably figure that out and make a blank blanker background. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. I've got to, I, I, I've got to <laughs> sort this out. <laughs> right, carry on, Matt. Yeah, so within the framework, basically my, my sort of the philosophy behind it is that each, that each student with CVI, even though each student is different, they all deserve, like we all deserve certain, certain things in their curriculum. And one is uh, tasks that are within their visual abilities. Um, and also uh, a good fit between the complexity level of each task and the complexity level of the environment. And I call this a balanced activity um, in the what's the complexity framework. Um, uh, an appropriate distribution of complexity throughout the day. So that's avoiding having like areas where there's just, just tons of complexity altogether. Um, and then visual breaks too, scheduled proactively throughout the school day. So I think that, you know, these are just the elements that we all would need if we had difficulty um, using our vision. Um, so let's, I wanted to just kind of take a look back at Aiden, who I introduced right in the beginning, and maybe to show how I've, I use the framework with a, well, one or two of his activities. Um, so uh, the first thing I, I, I will do with, with the what's the complexity framework for him is I have this document that goes through a lot of the um, different characteristics that I use uh, from Christine Roman's CVI range, like difficulty with complexity of objects, difficulty with complexity of the visual array, mm -hmm. you know, and so on, visually guided movement. Um, and this is just a little snapshot from this document um, and it's called the task bank. And uh, basically what I do is I go through like what I thought of as like the main tasks um, of being able to look at and interpret different types of targets. 
and uh, indicating whether it's comfortable for my student, like it's well within her visual abilities, whether it's challenging, meaning that it's the, at the upper end of his visual abilities, or whether it's frustrational, meaning that it's currently outside of his visual abilities. And I circle this, and this is just a worksheet, and that helps me um, sort of uh, get a, a good idea of what to put into this document that I call the individual complexity profile. And this is a one-page document that I give to the teams, and it's basically examples of different levels of tasks for them. So you see in the um, bottom, the, uh, the green column, is examples of um, what are what are tasks that are within Aiden's um, that are well within Aiden's visual abilities that are comfortable for him, and then what environments should we be expecting him to complete those activities in? And then same thing for challenging activities. What are some examples of activities visually that are right at the upper end of what he can do that are appropriate, but in what type of environment? And I've circled for Aiden that we should probably expect him to do those in moderately complex or minimally complex environments. And then what activities are currently frustrational for him and we shouldn't attempt those activities in any environment or those tasks in any environment um, but we can if they're appropriate tasks we can try to modify them so that they're comfortable or challenging for the student uh, and then uh, i have my uh, two rating guides uh, to rate the complexity of the task and the other is to rate the complexity of the environment so i'll just show real quick how i rated the complexity of the task for aiden's math activity in the classroom um, so for complexity of the object, I circled that it was challenging for him, that the targets were at the upper end of his ability to look at interpret, and interpret, and the targets were the uh, printed math problems, the numbers and, and operation signs. Um, and then for complexity of array, it was also challenging. So the array of materials was at the upper end of his visual abilities, and that's just because there were a lot of, a lot of numbers on one page close together. Um, so we had a, a complexity issue with that. Um, complexity of the sensory inputs um, from the actual task were comfortable. There weren't really any, any sounds or noises coming from the materials themselves, like you would maybe get from an iPad game or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, for distance, they were close. They were well within his ability from a distance standpoint. Um, they were challenging, again, from a visual motor standpoint. Because the, uh, because the problems, the math problems, were so close together, it was hard for him to aim, really, with his hand and use his vision to guide the, um, the, 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 his work. Um, for that problem. Uh, for visual latency, the pacing was also too fast. They were trying to help him keep up with the class and do this whole worksheet within about a 10 or 15 minute block. And that was just too fast for him to visually process everything. Uh, and then finally for visual novelty, um, he had never seen this particular worksheet before. It wasn't something he had memorized, it, the visual layout. And so it was all new for him and he was trying to process it all at once. Um, and in this framework, um, you're, you're usually gonna have uh, each of these components come out at different levels, but I just take whatever the highest rated components are and I make that the overall um, rating for the task. So I, I would tell the team that this was a challenging level task because of these different components. Um, and then I rated the complexity of the environment. So here's an example of what the environment was like uh, behind him. Uh, so complex visual array of information and there was also lots of, uh, lots of noise going on and, and lots of visual movement at the same time, the people walking by. And this is, I use the environmental rating guide to rate the complexity of his classroom. So for the complexity of the, of the array, I indicated high, that there was a high amount of competing background information in his visual field. For sensory input, I indicated high. So there was a steady level of noise in the background, uh, pencil sharpeners, people talking, papers getting crinkled up, doors opening, chairs shuffling, all those things. Um, visual movement. Um, there was actually, oh, it shouldn't say this. Actually, visual movement should be rated high. My circle's not, um, I must have animated it wrong or something, but um, it should have been rated high because there were people walking by his desk for throughout most of the activity. Um, and then impact of lighting, he doesn't have issues of being attracted to light or of being adverse to light, so it was fine for him. And then visual novelty of the environment was fine because he's very familiar with his spot in the classroom. So, but because we have two and we have three, should be um, in the high um, uh, rating, then it's a highly complex environment. Sure. So then I would show the team that, oh, go ahead, John. Yeah, no, no, I'm just agreeing. I'm just, I'm just looking at that. Yeah, great, good. Um, yeah, and then, and then so like I would tell the team, this was like sort of my recording form that I would say, okay, we've got this activity. We've got a highly complex environment with a challenging level task. You know, that's not really balanced. If we, if for Aiden, if he's gonna do a challenging level task, we want the environment to be moderate or minimal. If he's gonna do a highly complex, or if he's gonna be in a highly complex environment, we want the task to be comfortable. 
Um, so we want to balance the activity. And here's where I had to make the decision in his case, do we, and with the team, of course, but do we want to um, just take that math work and always do it in that quieter environment? Or do we want to keep him in that general ed environment as much as we can and address the task? And that's really where the values of the family and the student and the team come in. Because, you know, we could have easily said one or the other. If he was really, if he hated being in the general ed classroom and his family didn't really want him in that environment and it just seemed like it was more of just too overwhelming for him, then maybe it would have made sense to go to the quieter room to do math all the time. But because he enjoyed being with his peers and because he's, it wasn't, he could be in the general ed environment for things like snack, for you know, playtime for things like that. So um, it seemed like it wasn't the environment itself that was causing his issues here. It was the combination of being in that environment and being asked to do a highly complex academic task at the same time. Um, now in kindergarten, he was able to be in that in the kindergarten class most of the day because it was mostly non-academic type activities. But as he was in first grade, activities were getting more and more academic. And our worry as a team was, if we keep having him go to that quieter environment for all academic activities, pretty soon that's gonna represent most of the school day. And we don't wanna do that. So we just, we looked at, let's look at the task. Let's try to balance that activity by looking at the task instead. And we thought if we can sort of over modify the task to bring it back down to his comfortable level, then could he do it in the general ed classroom with more comfort? And um, so what we did was, we sort of went back, we kept the printed numbers, but we went back to a little bit more of a manipulative based system too, where he could have, he could sort of adjust the spacing himself. Um, things were more spread out. He could, you know, take things off and move them around to, to count the manipulatives and stuff. And we only had one problem at a time. We had a blank background and uh, we used spacing and we used color uh, to also help him like, you know, if the operation sign and the equal signs are a different color, then that sort of helps it. And so it doesn't all get squished together in his brain and he's not sort of mixing up the operation signs with the numbers and things like that. So using this system, which was a comfortable level visual task for him, Aiden was then able to stay in the general ed classroom and do the same problems his peers were doing. He would do fewer problems. If there were 10 addition problems, he might do six or five, but he was doing the same basic problems they were doing with it right alongside his peers. So, oh, great, great. I just love, uh, uh, I love the simplicity of the complexity, <laughs> you know, right. the fact that you're just, you know, you're, I mean, I mean, it's just, I mean, I mean, I, I, mean, I, I do really, really like this framework. Uh, you know, when, when I saw you presented, I, I, I said, I don't remember who I was, I was like, this was, this is great. And I really need to get to understand this because it, you know, just, just working out this as well, uh, you know, it, it enables the child then to, like you say, stay in the general ed classes. It's like, hey, doing six instead of 10. Hey, that's okay. <laughs> you know, right, right, that's fine. Right. And, and, then, and you know, it's, it's the same type of problems. It's the same math. You know, it's all, it's great mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah, oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, I've got a little more, but I'll go, I won't spend too much time on the rest of the slides. <laughs> It's um, so, so as much time as you need, Matt, as much time right. as you need. <laughs> <laughs> well, so for, I wanted to show a couple other short activities in Aiden's day just to show the sort of like how there's just different ways to address it, you know. So then there was the math. Um, so he was still doing some math problems in his quiet resource room. That was sort of the ones that he was like, were sort of like that he was just learning the novel types of skills. And then once he had those skills, he would do them with his peers in the general ed classroom. And so um, he, for a while, he was facing a blank wall in his in his one-on-one uh, -on -one resource room, and it was going great. And then I, I got an email from the team one day that said he was more off task in his resource room. And so I went in and they had redesigned the room so that this was now his view from his desk. And so they were holding up these math cards for him. And I just sort of like recreated that scene here by pasting one in, but this was the background in his room. And um, he was he was just visually distracted by everything that was happening in the background. So I used the same format again and I showed them. So now we've got math flashcards in the individual workspace. And even though you're in this quiet room, because of what's in his background now in his visual field, you've got a highly complex environment because of the visual array. And so you've got a highly complex environment with a challenging level task. Now it's unbalanced again. So all I suggested was, now in this case, let's just address the environment. Let's, let's rearrange it to how it was before. So by turning his desk 90 degrees, we were able to get to that view again, which was just the other, other corner of the wall. And then it was much better for him because he didn't have all that distracting information in the background. Um, 
And then the final activity of his I just wanted to show is for reading. So this is an example of um, a, a reading passage for a kid, I think in, in about the first grade level. And when we would show him reading passages like this in the beginning, um, he, he would really struggle with it. Um, the, the, the point that he was at was that he was able to do um, sight words really well. He had learned to do sight words using Christine Roman's bubble outline color technique, uh, where you take like the word and you tightly outline it in a color to sort of show that whole, that whole kind of gestalt mm -hmm. um, shape of the word. Um, and, uh, you know, we could take the word out of the bubble outline and he could match the word with the bubble. And then after he learned about 150 sight words, we were able to take the ones he mastered the most and take the bubbles off of them and he could do them without the bubbles. And then the new ones, he did better if we introduced them with the bubbles until he mastered them. So anyway, we, you know, he was doing very well with that. But when we started reading connected text with him, the team was saying that, you know, he would kind of give up and it was just too much. So when I would look at a text like this that they were asking him to do, it was just too cluttered, too, too close together. You know, whether we call it like um, a complexity of array or simultanagnosia, I mean, it was just too much squished close together for him to read. And so again, I went back to sort of this framework and said, okay, here we've got a minimally complex environment in the resource room where he's working on this literacy task, but we've got a task that's frustrational. It's outside of his visual abilities because of the visual clutter and how close the complexity of array, how close all the, letter, all the words are. So um, we came up with uh, this method here where um, what we did was we double spaced each line. So there was, uh, the lines were less squished together. And then we found out that we could, we could do one of two things with the words. We could either triple space the words on, like Word, on Microsoft Word mm -hmm. so that they didn't blend together for him. Um, or we could keep them single spaced and we can alternate every other color. So then it was not the spacing, but the color that was helping him separate it in his brain. So, I mean, that's what I think was happening. So like the, the letters in ginger, for instance, are highlighted in yellow. So to him, that's a perceptual unit now. And those letters are diff belong to a different perceptual unit than the letters in went. You know, whereas in before he was kind of blending them all together. So um, his paraprofessional and his teacher actually came up with this method because uh, they knew that they had learned early on that using um, when he was counting manipulatives, if they alternated colors and did like blue, red, blue, red, or green, yellow, green, yellow, he would do much better. And so they tried it with words and it worked really well for him. All right. That's um, really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So, and this is the last slide. I just, the reason why I really use it is, is for this reason, uh, the, for Aiden, for that first student who I used it with, um, it was about partway through the year that we really started using what's the complexity as I was developing it. And um, things just started going a lot better. And the team just sort of, the, the team really um, was able to generalize those in interventions throughout his day. So that when I would go in, most activities now were being appropriately adapted and just more intentionally planned. And at the last PPT of the year, um, his dad came up to me at the end and he said, hey, I just wanna thank you for, for, for using this, this system that you're using with my son because it's really given the ship a rudder. Um, and I just like that. that, that was the intent, was like, we've got the knowledge. The team knows about complexity. They know what kinds of things bother them. They just, we just needed something to kind of steer the ship of collaboration as we all work together toward the year. And for me, that this, what's the complexity framework just worked well for that. Brilliant, great. Excellent, excellent. I've got a, um, a couple of sort of like generic questions, if you don't mind, Matt. Sure. So, so, so I, um, I, I teach, so on, on our um, TVI program, uh, I, I, I teach that we are the um, absolute leaders for agents for change, right? We are, we are the specialists and, and, we, and we can change things, not just for the, the child with a, a, a vision impairment, but actually for the whole class, right? Most of the kids yeah. are in general ed education wow. classes or in mainstream classes. You can see where this is going, right? And so, and so rather than being seen as a specialist that's out there, that's, that's sort of like, not really within an inclusive agenda, but absolutely we are the leaders of inclusion, right? Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I like to teach this in a way that actually, yeah, this has huge and massive positive benefits for the child with CVI, even the child with, with, with um, uh, ocular visual impairment. But, but I wonder, have you done anything for just like for the whole class? You know, this, this seems to me so beneficial for, for every child yeah, in this class. Absolutely. You know? That's such a great point. Yeah. So there's, um, I have a student right now who, uh, it, it's funny that you mentioned that because we, um, you know, she's in, in an all academic track uh, for her education, um, but she really, um, she really benefits from the use of color. 
um, on her on her things. You know, the color like we used sort of in that last example I showed where you take a complex math problem or a, or a page from a, a worksheet or something and using color to sort of help group and segment and, and, and process the information. Um, and so, you know, like, let's say we have a, um, a geometry problem. And if we can color code like the different parts of the equation that correspond to like the height and the width of the, of the diagram, it, it just, it helps her process it all and put it together. So the, the special ed teacher and I will spend maybe about an hour or two modifying each assessment, uh, each test uh, for class in math. And then a lot of times now the teacher is using that modified version for the whole class because he said that the kids like it better. So it's, it's visually like if you think about like most math textbooks, I'm actually doing a lot of online math with my kids right now, homeschooling, and uh, they're using this um, company called Khan Academy. And what I noticed the other day is I'm sitting down with my son and everything that Khan Academy was doing was, was like in line with what we're doing for this student with CVI. So they're yeah. doing one problem at a time with a black background and they're color coding everything. So it's more easily digestible from a visual perceptual standpoint for the kids. And when I do that for this student, like the teacher is just using it for the whole class and he's seeing how like they, even though they could do it the other way, it's more comfortable and enjoyable for them to do it with that color and extra space to kind of chunk everything and group everything for them. So yeah, that's definitely, that's one example I can think of. Yeah, great, great. That's a great example. So all you QTVIs out there, you are the leaders of inclusion, I'm telling you. Yeah. The other thing I, I want to ask really, um, well, there's two more, two more, uh, is um, to do, you know, to, so, so do you map this then for the whole day, for the whole activity, for the child, and, and how long, how long does it take to do to do that mapping? Yeah, yeah. So for um, sometimes I'll so I have a, um, a single activity recording form too. So sometimes I'll just go out for a single activity. Like let's say the student's schedule is going pretty well. There don't seem to be concerns. The team really seems to have it down. But then they start a new science unit or go to a new art class halfway through the year, and all of a sudden there's 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 issues. I might come in and just do a single activity for that and use the what's the complexity framework just for that activity. But more often than not, I am doing the full day. Um, and I'll either do that by just giving up, like clearing a day in my schedule to spend all day with that student and follow them from class to class. Or sometimes if I can't do that, I'll do like maybe one week, I'll do the whole morning up through lunch. And then maybe the next week, I'll do the whole afternoon after lunch and kind of put the two together. And so it typically takes me a day total to do a what's the complexity assessment. And then usually I'll go home and write a report. Usually I've got my iPad with me. So I'm actually kind of filling in the forms as I go along. Um, but I'll go kind of finalize a report, write the recommendations, and then uh, typically have a team meeting um, a week or two later uh, with the team to kind of go over my findings and do some brainstorming with them. All right, uh, uh, that's great. And, and I guess um, my final question on this is, how can people get hold of it? Where can they read, read about this and, and, and you know, yeah. look at it? Oh, there we go. <laughs> All right, there so, you go. Hang on, I've moved, yeah. the, I've moved the, um, uh, uh, the video talk, so I've got to somehow figure out how to get it back. So hang on. Uh, oh, yeah. let's, oh, there we go. There we are. Right. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's in Christine Roman Lancy's new book, uh, Cortical Visual Impairment, Advanced Principles. It's chapter four. And um, I just want to, I should thank her too for all the guidance that she's given me. It's like a pretty long chapter with a lot of forms, but it started out like in 2014 or 13, I started working on it and it was a one page document um, that had a little rating scale on it. And I remember showing it to her at a workshop and she just kept encouraging me saying, take this somewhere, keep going with it, keep developing it. Let me know what you come up with. And so by having somebody that I really looked up to like her um, and had learned so much already about CVI from her, like say, hey, keep going with this. It was really nice to just, just get that feedback. And then along the way, um, you know, Amanda Lueck uh, helped out with it as well. And I mean, just people just taking their time to give feedback and everything that they didn't have to do it. But um, it really, I, I wouldn't have been able to come up with all this without them. Excellent. Good. Good. And, uh, you know, and, that, and that's why I just love this field. You know, people are just, um, mm -hmm. we just want to help. We want to support, we, you know, we just want to help each other support, ultimately support the family and the kids. You know, it doesn't matter if you're, mm -hmm. whether you're America or you're UK, European, Australian, whatever. It's yeah. just, we're just one big family of, of, yeah. of, of you know, yeah. sharing and, and supporting each other, which I love this field. Listen, yeah, Matt. Me too. I think I've taken up a, a, a lot of your time. I just really want to say um, a, a huge thanks for this. You know, I, I think 
I think it's really important, uh, the work that you're doing, uh, uh, and it's so great that you, you've offered your time and your expertise on this video so all can share and watch it and, and, and use it. I, I just think it's magnificent, Matt. So I really just want to say thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. And my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me on. I appreciate all right. it. And, and I'm sure we'll speak soon. Okay. Sounds good. Take care, Matt. I'll speak to Take you care. soon. Bye.